Coming to us out of the sky, the familiar voice of radio brings endless hours of entertainment, information, and cheer. In every home, its magic moments are an indispensable part of daily life. The setting of one dial brings music. Another, the morning's news bulletins. A housewife turns to shopping hints. Another makes notes of a new recipe. A man gets the day's market trends or latest sports reports. Or a shut-in smiles and relaxes to that morning word of cheer. Behind the scenes, a vast and skilled organization and intricate technical apparatus produce the miracle of words and music coming to us through the air. But the entertaining hours of radio have not been with us always. Back in 1920, in a dimly lighted room over his garage, Dr. Frank Conrad built and operated the first experimental broadcasting transmitter. Here, radio broadcasting was born. This brilliant Westinghouse scientist had no intention of going into the broadcasting business as he sent phonograph music over the air. He was working on the wireless telephone. But these first whispers of the voice of radio were not unheard as they were broadcast by Dr. Conrad. A surprising number of letters were received from unsuspected listeners, also pioneers, who had improvised primitive crystal sets. The world's first radio audience was in the making. I can't understand what that boy does with all his time, fooling with wires and that silly thing on his head. Mom, Dad, come quick. Dad, quick, listen, there's music uh -huh. on the air. Well, if that don't beat the... Any idea where it's coming from, son? From Wilkinsburg, just outside of Pittsburgh. A Westinghouse engineer by the name of Conrad is sending it. Isn't it swell? Boy, well, I have something to tell the fellas tomorrow. Encouraged by the interest which his experiments had awakened among his unseen audience, Dr. Conrad expanded his work in the little laboratory over the garage. One night in the basement of a Pittsburgh department store, a clerk was listening. More people knew about these programs. Perhaps there'd be more wireless parts, so... That's an idea. The result of that idea was the first newspaper advertisement to promote the sale of wireless parts. And from that advertisement, one man caught a vision. That man was H.P. Davis, vice president of Westinghouse, soon to be known as the father of radio broadcasting. Then we are agreed, gentlemen, that the possibilities of wireless go far beyond its use in private communication that we will establish a system of mass communication with regular programs in the public interest, news, weather reports, music, speeches, all manner of entertainment we will send over the air. We will establish a great new public institution. We'll call it broadcasting. A bold and pioneering decision that was, and the result was immediate action. In less than one month, radio station KDKA was on the air, bringing to a few hundred people, practically all of whom had built their own receiving sets, the world's first scheduled broadcast. We are bringing you early election returns. North Atlantic states give a substantial lead to Warren Harding over James Cox. Almost overnight, radio graduated from a hobby to a national institution. Receivers with tubes began to replace the homemade crystal sets. And when there weren't enough earphones to go around, Mother's mixing bowl came in handy as a loudspeaker. Yes, regular programs did create a widespread desire for radio sets. So much so, in fact, that manufacturers couldn't meet demand. People began to expect interesting programs on the air. Radio broadcasting became an industry which kept pace with the trend of the time. Westinghouse pioneered this growth of radio, beginning with the first broadcasting station, 
KDKA. As more service through radio became practical, Westinghouse added other stations. WBZ Boston, KYW Philadelphia, WBZA Springfield, WOWO Fort Wayne, KEX Portland, WBOS International Shortwave Station at Boston. Broadcasting swept the country until by the middle 20s, over 500 stations crowded the radio map. Everywhere, the voice of radio began to fill the air. In the city, on the farm, in school, country stores, city workshops and offices, and even automobiles, bringing entertainment, news and culture to all who cared to listen. In the early days of broadcasting, few people realized what a fine art radio was to become or what an influence it was destined to wield upon mankind. With the inception of broadcasting as an industry, the enormous cost of keeping entertaining and informative programs on the air presented a problem, for there was no income. Then one day, someone realized that radio had great value as an advertising medium. Station operators learned they could sell time on the air to commercial companies who in turn sponsored fine programs of various kinds to advertise their products to those who listened. Business turned to radio because people listened and bought little things and big things, all the things people need and need to know about before they buy. Increased sales also brought lower prices along with more work and more wages. Thus, the service of radio to our economic life was developed. Today, there are more than 1,000 radio stations broadcasting in the same ether. But there are only a limited number of frequencies or pathways through the air to carry all these programs. To keep them from interfering with each other, the government groups all radio stations into certain classifications. KDKA in Pittsburgh, for example, is assigned a frequency for its exclusive use. It is also allowed maximum power and unlimited radiation in all directions so that its programs may reach rural and even national audiences. WOWO Fort Wayne shares its frequency or its location on your radio dial with one other station at a distant location, achieving wide coverage free of interference in its own section of the country. Other types of stations, such as KEX Portland, provide concentrated coverage of a single city or local area. In certain cases, to provide better coverage of the service area or to avoid interference, a special kind of directional antenna is used. In the case of WBZ Boston, the radio beams are focused inland as well as up and down the coastline to prevent much of its power being lost at sea. And at KYW in Philadelphia, still another kind of pattern covers the service area. The radiation is directed in this manner. Still, other programs are beamed to the far corners of the earth by shortwave broadcasts. This type of service had its start with the issuing of the first shortwave broadcast license to Westinghouse in 1922. With its unique system of directional antennae, WBOS of Boston, for example, can direct its powerful shortwave voice as desired. Transmitimos este mensaje desde la estación radiotelefónica WBOS situada en Boston, centro de las difusiones internacionales. Boston. Internacional Radio Central, que es una gran usluge. The voice of radio, eliminating the barriers that for countless centuries have inhibited man's communication with man. Now, suppose we see what goes on inside a modern broadcasting station and how a program is created. To keep the great flow of programs continually on the air requires a complex structure and skilled organization. The average station broadcasts about 19 hours each day, from before dawn until after midnight. And every minute of that time, there must be some program going out to the unseen audience. Dramatic and variety programs must be created or adapted to radio. For these programs, performers must be carefully selected and the programs rehearsed over and over. The dialogue must be smooth, the pace right, dramatic peaks or laughs properly spaced, 
and the whole thing timed to the split second, for there's no second chance in radio. Special or arranged music has to be rehearsed, timed and fitted to the theme and action of each dramatic or variety program. Sound effects also play an important role in radio and are worked out to convey a sense of realism to the listening audience. Let's see how this is done. Say, Mr. Soundman, how would you get a big crowd into the studio in a hurry? Oh, that's too easy. Now, how about those sinister footsteps we always hear when the radio villain comes to do his dastardly deed? Oh, that gives me the chills. Have you got a good storm up your sleeve to go with it? What a night for a murder. Better get the hero indoors. Well, get going. Now, how about a nice crackling fire in the fireplace? Wonder if that villain is still out on the stairs. We'd better call in some help. Well, we didn't need all those policemen. Oh, I get it. But suppose we'd rather have the Lone Ranger come galloping to the rescue. How would you get him on the job? Say, you sound effects men are a bunch of fakers. But wait a minute. Supposing the story calls for the sound of breaking glass, what would you do about that? Well, well, stumped you at last. You can imitate storms and galloping horses, but you can't imitate a simple sound like, uh, hey, look out. <laughs> well, I asked for it. Putting a studio program on the air requires perfect coordination of actors, production staff, and studio technicians. A switch is flipped, a dial is turned, and on the exact second, the show is on the air. During rehearsals, this show was tailored and trimmed to fit exactly within the allotted time. And it's up to the production staff to see that this schedule is maintained. And you, the audience, for whom this show was written, rehearsed and broadcast, will vote for or against it by tuning the program in or switching it off. While some programs may require weeks of preparations, others must be prepared in a matter of seconds. In rooms like this, news pours in from the far reaches of the globe. Over great worldwide news services come bulletins, flashes, follow-up stories from everywhere. News that is carefully edited to bulletin form so that it reaches its audience quickly and concisely. Here is a new form of journalism that radio itself has created. History in the making, brought to the ears of a nation in the shortest possible time. The ringing bell heralds an important news flash. If it is important enough, the regular program will be interrupted. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin from the emergency flood control headquarters. Flood waters have reached a new high in the southern area. All families are advised... Thus, the radio listener is never more than a few seconds removed from the news as it happens. Service such as this is only a part of radio station activity. 
Network programs may originate in New York, Pittsburgh, Hollywood, or anywhere. Or they may be on-the-spot broadcasts where great events are in the making. Such programs are received over special wires and are handled at this master control desk, which is the nerve center of the radio station. To put any radio program on the air requires far more than just the familiar microphone. Suppose we step behind the scenes and see just how this is done. The microphone responds to the vibrations of sound waves that strike it, converting those vibrations into similar vibrations of electrical energy called an audio wave. This wave travels over wires to the studio control room, where, if we could see it, it might look something like this. Not yet strong enough to do its job, it is amplified or strengthened until it is this size. But it still has a long way to go before reaching your home radio. So let's follow this wave on its amazing journey. Leaving the studio building, it travels perhaps many miles over wires that are specially designed so that none of its tone frequencies or vibrations will be lost, though some of its power will be gone when it finally reaches the transmitting station, which is generally located away from the city, where there are better transmitting conditions and ample space for the towering antenna. Now, let's get back to our audio wave. It has just arrived from the studio and gets a re-strengthening until it looks something like this. Then, moving along to another amplifier, it passes through and comes out like this. Once more amplified, it is now powerful enough, but it is not the right kind of wave to travel over the air. So, over here, in what is known as a crystal oscillator, another wave is generated. A high-speed wave having millions of vibrations per second. It would look something like this if we could see it. This wave, however, also must be strengthened. So on it goes into other amplifiers, where it comes out a strong, far-reaching carrier wave capable of transporting a program round the world in a seventh of a second. This wave is ready for the air except for one thing. It has no program on it. You wouldn't hear anything if we were to broadcast just a plain carrier wave. So we go back and pick up the audio wave that we left a moment ago. And we use this to control the strength of the carrier wave. We are now modulating the carrier waves. The combination looks something like this. It is now a complete radio wave. And through these wires, it goes to the antenna tower. Up. Up. Up to where it is hurled out into space with the speed of light. Now our program actually is on the air. When you tune your radio to the same frequency as the transmitter's carrier wave, your loudspeaker will give a true reproduction of the studio program. And today, on radio's elaborate bill of fare, there are programs to fit every desire and need. The inspiration of religious services, once found by church walls. Great opera and music, once the privilege of only the fortunate few. The progress of science, once revealed only to the limited memberships of technical society. Championship sports. Great events that shaped the course of history as they happen. The whole panorama of life and the world today presented for the enlightenment and pleasure of everyone. Yes, the history of radio is brilliant. And new patterns of service, many of them born of wartime research, are in the making. Your new home receiver, with its new developments and improvements, is your link with radio broadcasting. The finest in entertainment, news and culture. The best the world can provide. Television, the miracle of broadcasting both voice and picture through the air is assured.
In research and planning departments, many new creations of radio are being made ready for the benefit of the vast radio audience. Because of the peculiar characteristics of the high frequency waves which carry television and FM, their range of broadcast is limited to visual distance only. To procure broader coverage, it is necessary to locate such stations at the highest possible location. To carry these new type programs for long distances and to approach the coverage now available through standard broadcasts, it is necessary to install many relay or booster stations also located at high location. Such multiple relay, however, presents distortion problems and losses. As a great contribution to the faithful reception of these services, Westinghouse engineers have developed a system for broadcasting frequency modulation and television called Stratovision. This provides for several large airborne broadcast stations flying at a height of six miles above the Earth. By this system, each plane would be equipped with several television and frequency modulation broadcasting transmitters, providing for greater and more faithful reproduction. A number of these Stratovision planes will bring the finest of television and FM programs to the vast majority of America. Yes, radio broadcasting has come a long way since the days of Dr. Conrad. As each radio day brings information, entertainment, and education into your home, science continues to reach into the future, planning and developing new services that will make your home the center of the universe, so that the whole wide world of pictures, colors, and sounds will be as close to you as your radio.